Welcome to how people with Parkinson's and care partners are helping design research. My name is Krista Ellis and I'm a program manager for the Parkinson's Foundation. The Parkinson's Foundation will be hosting virtual events each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. To learn more and to register, please visit parkinson.org backslash pdhealth. You can also visit this page to view past archived PD Health at Home programs. Before introducing our speakers, we'd love to ask you, our audience, a question pertaining to today's topic. If you have any technical challenges with the poll or at any time, please use the Q&A icon and we'll respond to you right away. Do you see the question has appeared on your screen? Have you ever been interested in joining a research study? Great, so we've got about 60% of you have said yes, that's wonderful. 13% of our audience today have said no, they have not been interested in joining a research study. And 27% says it's possible. So great, thank you so much for sharing. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Pat Davies. Pat was an organizer of major international conferences for over 35 years. The first half of her career was in London, United Kingdom, and in 1991, she moved to Washington, D.C. to lead the organization of the World Bank and International Monetary Fund annual meetings. Pat retired in 2007 and in January 2009 was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. For six years, Pat served on the board of the World Parkinson Coalition and is a Parkinson's Foundation research advocate. When she's not working on things related to Parkinson's disease, she loves to cook, bake, and entertain. In 2016, she was named as a Washingtonian of the year for her work with the homeless, and she remains involved in a weekend feeding program for the homeless and underserved. Thank you so much for joining us today, Pat. Pat, are you here with us? Can you hear me now? I can hear you. And can you see me now? I can't quite see you. Oh. Yeah, Pat, okay. it looks like your camera is working just fine. Oh, great. Yeah, it's, got, it's working or it's not working? Sorry. It is working. Okay, sorry. <laughs> We're okay now, are we? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Krista, again. <laughs> Thank you very much for the warm welcome. I'm happy to be here with everyone today. Before I discuss the Parkinson's Foundation Research Advocacy Program, which some of you might remember was formerly called the PAIR, P-A-I-R Program, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my journey with Parkinson's so far and why I chose to participate in this program and in various clinical trials. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in January 2009, but I recall experiencing symptoms a couple of years before the official diagnosis, and one of the most troublesome was something I called brain fog. It felt like my brain was full of glue, and it was an immense effort to think clearly and logically. I was just coming to the end of my 35 year career as an organizer of major international conferences. So I was used to being able to think in a clear and well-organized way most of the time. I also had challenges with handwriting. I think it's called micronesia. Walking, my legs felt like I belonged to somebody else. Fine motor skills and things which required repetitive movements, such as stirring something, brushing my teeth or combing my hair. After my diagnosis, I began to read everything I could about the disease. And I noticed that many articles began with the words, people with Parkinson's and their caregivers. But how could that apply to me? I lived alone and had no family. So I very quickly realized that I have to be my own advocate and caregiver 
and that there was much to learn about this strange and misunderstood disease. In 2010, I made another important step in my Parkinson's journey when I attended the second World Parkinson Congress, which was in Glasgow. And I met many other people with Parkinson's, including some with young onset Parkinson's disease, who completely inspired me. And I vowed that I'd follow their examples and try and become as active as I could in some of the various Parkinson's disease organizations while I still was able. One of the things I did pretty quickly was join a support group. And one of the other members told me about an observational trial he'd participated in. It was being run by a PhD student and it sounded interesting and fun. So I first got involved in observational trials and later my interests turned to drug trials. I didn't have to ask anyone for permission because I was single and had no family. And I didn't even think twice about it because it was an easy decision for me. And so I'm proud to say that today I'm one of over 350 individuals who are Parkinson's disease foundation, Parkinson Foundation research advocates. So what is the Parkinson's Foundation Research Advocacy Program? It's a national program that focuses on creating efficient and effective research by bringing together the people who live with Parkinson's and the people who are developing new treatments for the disease. And what exactly does patient engagement in research mean? Patient engagement means that people with Parkinson's and their care partners are sufficiently motivated to help find better treatments for the disease, that they work with scientists to design and run research studies. This makes perfect sense to me because we, the people with Parkinson's, truly have insight and can provide valuable information and guidance to those working to find new and better treatments. Participants in the research advocacy program must commit to improving patient engagement in research, either by directly participating in research studies or by working with research teams to help design and create studies. We can also work with others to identify ways in which patient engagement can be used or improved. So why is patient engagement so important? Well, when people with Parkinson's and care partners are included as members of the research team, research at all phases of the process focuses on issues that are most important to the Parkinson's community, which makes clinical trials less burdensome and easier to participate in. And as a result, research is faster and better and research advocates can actually be responsible for driving research and drug development. Also, people with Parkinson's and care partners are experts living with PD, as we live with the disease for every second of every day, whether we want to or not. And therefore, we deserve a seat at the table when research decisions are being made, because we're the people most impacted by the outcomes of research. As I mentioned earlier, the Parkinson's Foundation Research Advocacy Program has over 350 people with Parkinson's, like me, as well as care partners who are trained in the research process and represent 40 states across the nation, with the breakdown being approximately 80% people with Parkinson's and 20% care partners. Research advocates are chosen through an application process. They represent a broad cross-section of the Parkinson's community from newly diagnosed people to people who've had Parkinson's disease for over 20 years, from rural and urban areas and from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds. Once selected, advocates attend training called the Learning Institute and at that training, which I completed in 2014, coincidentally at the same time as today's next speaker, John Tomney, 
We spent over three and a half days learning about different kinds of research and important issues like how to interpret research and how to work with scientists. So that after the training, we worked with researchers at drug companies, healthcare centers, and in the government to design and run studies. This slide shows the participants in the Learning Institute class of 2019 with the researchers and Parkinson's Foundation staff who taught the course. So what exactly do research advocates do? They advise researchers on how to design a study while considering questions such as what does the Parkinson's community think is a high priority to study? Or how can we make study easier to take part in? Or how many visits is too many? Also, co coincidentally, John Tomini reminded me yesterday that we both participated in a meeting to help Pfizer study a design, a study design by providing key feedback on aspects of the research. As an example, during that meeting, we mentioned that some people with Parkinson's find fine motor movements difficult. So when designing an app, careful consideration must be given to the size and placement of the buttons needed to operate. As I'm sure you all know, if you, like me, struggle to use these um, phones that they have these days, the iPhones, uh, with a lot of difficulty. Some other examples of feedback you can provide are sharing community priorities for research or talking about how many visits you'd be prepared to make to a study site or even how you get to the study site since many people with Parkinson's can no longer drive. For example, I get double vision sometimes. I've been prescribed glasses with prisms in the lenses which corrects the problem but one of the drug studies I did was in Baltimore, about 35 miles up the I-95 from Washington DC where I live. And there is no way that I was going to do that drive, prisms or no prisms, at the height of the morning rush hour. For the first few visits, I persuaded some good friends to take me by letting them sit in on, on the visit and listen to my fascinating medical history and watching me have blood taken and having an EKG. And best of all, I treated them to lunch at a nearby cafe before the drive home. After a few visits, I noticed that inexplicably, my friends had other engagements on at the days I needed them. This was disappointing and puzzling. So I explained my dilemma to the staff manning the, running the study, and to my great surprise, they arranged a car service for each visit so I could spend almost two hours eating peppermints on the way there and back and seeing how many bottles of water I could drink while I read the newspapers and pretended I was rich and famous. So as research advocates, we can also create best practices for patient engagement in research and consider questions like, how do we help people with Parkinson's disease who have cognitive impairment design research with scientists or advise researchers how to best work with people with Parkinson's, for example, by creating guidelines for working with our population. Or we can train and encourage other people with Parkinson's to be research advocates and educate the Parkinson's community about research. I'm currently on the national leadership team of a project that's creating patient advisory boards at the Foundation Centers of Excellence. We're creating a training course for people with Parkinson's and researchers to teach them how to work together on a type of research called comparative effectiveness research. Being a research advocate has given me the opportunity to work with researchers who want to develop better therapies which might improve my life and the lives of others. And who knows, it might even lead to a cure. We can hope, can't we? If you'd like to know more, please feel free to contact me or the Parkinson's Foundation Senior Director of Community Engagement, Carlin Schroeder or visit the Parkinson's Foundation website at www 
parkinson.org. Thank you very much for listening and uh, be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Pat, for sharing your inspiration, for becoming an advocate for yourself and for others. I really appreciate you. Before I introduce our next speaker, just a quick reminder that questions can be submitted by clicking on the Q&A icon in the black banner on the bottom of your viewing page. So if you're thinking of a question to ask Patricia, please feel free to submit it into the Q&A icon. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker. John Tomini is a semi-retired IT asset management professional, an international standards author, a Parkinson's Foundation research advocate, a public policy advisor to the US Congress, a motivational speaker, a licensed pedaling with Parkinson's instructor, a lifetime cyclist, a sailor, husband, full-time dad, and a person living with Parkinson's. He was diagnosed with PD on August 14, 2014. Since the day of his diagnosis, he has sought to understand how to improve the quality of life for people with Parkinson's. John, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you, Krista. As Krista mentioned a moment ago, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2014. On the day of my diagnosis with Parkinson's, upon learning that I was a cyclist, my neurologist, Dr. Mary Feldman, told me about Dr. Jay Alberts of Cleveland Clinic. As a resident, she had worked with Dr. Alberts on a study that examined the effects of forced exercise on both motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Dr. Alberts found that forcing patients to spin bicycle pedals between 60 RPMs and 80 RPMs for up to 60 minutes produced profound improvement in the motor symptoms of PD, a person's ability to walk, sign their name, reduced tremors, improved balance and mobility, and reduced bradykinesia. On that very day when I left my neurologist's office, I got on my bike and I rode 10 miles north on the flattest road that I could find. And then I turned around and I rode 10 miles back, all the while attempting to spin my pedals as close to 80 RPMs as possible. If you've ever done that, you know it's difficult out on the road. All that I accomplished that day was to feel tired on top of the shock and the despair of the diagnosis. But I kept riding every couple of days, and by the end of the first week, I, had, I felt more in control of my body and less affected by Parkinson's. Over the years since that first week, I've learned that the more that I ride my bike, the better I can walk and do other things. Later that year, Dr. Feldman received an inquiry from the Parkinson's Foundation, asking her to recommend patients of hers who she felt would be good candidates for the foundation to advocate for Parkinson's research. She says that I was the first person that came to her mind and she recommended me immediately. After a personally challenging application process that prompted me to really think deeply about my motivations to serve as an advocate. I was invited to join the foundation uh, for three and a half days of training at the Learning Institute that Pat and I both attended to become a pair, a pair, Parkinson's advocate in research. After the training, which Julie spoke about I mean, Patricia spoke about earlier. I went home with fresh enthusiasm to get started with promoting research. Uh, I had already been thinking about different forms of exercise and the impact that each type of exercise had on me. I noticed that Tai Chi and yoga improved my balance. Boxing and weightlifting both gave me better control of my arms and hands 
you heard Pat mention earlier that her legs felt like they belonged to somebody else. Well, I felt that way about my arms. They felt like they were not really part of my body. But uh, a lot of uh, uh, free weight work and boxing uh, made them feel much more connected. And cycling improved a broad range of movement and non-movement disorders. Uh, so I became curious about whether there were certain types of exercise that were more effective on specific issues, much like my own anecdotal experience had shown. Dr. Feldman was curious about my ideas and began a literature study of her own to help focus the study toward topics that had not yet been researched sufficiently and would be of interest to others in the medical community. We met occasionally for coffee over the next few weeks to develop our study design, actually as a few months. Mary decided that we should study non-motor symptoms, specifically anxiety, depression, and fatigue, because they were both understudied by the medical community and under-recognized by both patients and providers, and yet they were increasingly common among Parkinson's patients. This poster summarizes the study design, the hypothesis, the methods, the results, and the conclusions of the study. I'm not qualified to give a technical presentation of the results, but I'll offer some anecdotal comments. We found that depression and thoughts of suicide vanished almost completely in all of the participants. Aerobic exercise and the social aspects of dance appeared to be helpful in treating depression. And spinning, the most aerobic exercise intervention of the three, appeared to have the most profound and lasting impact across all participants. The chart on the right is a study continuum. It provides guidance for all of the stages of designing, conducting, and reporting on a study. I'm going to use it today to describe the ways that I contributed to this study. I have no medical or scientific training, but through reading the abstracts, reports, and poster presentations of other studies, and following the guidance of this continuum on this slide, I was able to make useful contributions toward our study and provide significant value to the researchers. As it worked out, I was able to provide value in seven of the 10 topics listed on this chart. Before I tell you about them, I'm gonna tell you a story about my first experience with this chart upon returning from the Paralearning Institute. After my training, Dr. Feldman asked me to invite a colleague of hers, Dr. Stephen Lee, to a lunch meeting and win him over to the idea of having a patient advocate serve on the study team. That was kind of a nervous experience, but I did it. And at the meeting, I handed this continuum to Dr. Lee and explained that the purpose of the Parkinson's Advocate and Research Program was to bring the voice of Parkinson's patients into research. I explained that I was very new to the program, but I had been trained to work with researchers in each of these 10 areas to improve the effectiveness of Parkinson's research. I was hoping he wouldn't ask me too many questions. Much to my surprise, Steve immediately embraced the idea and I joined the team. I then started working on item one on the continuum and began explaining how I had been trained to assist in each of the function, functions listed. The first point in developing the study concept is very important. 
that being discussed with researchers what research is important to the Parkinson's community. Mary and I had many discussions about what research would be important. I brought the newly diagnosed patient's perspective and she pointed out topics of interest that were understudied. Dr. Feldman and I collaborated on writing a grant application that we submitted to the Parkinson's Foundation through the PEAR program. Since that study, more recently, I've served as a grant reviewer for the Parkinson's Foundation Community Grants Awards. We had many discussions about the study protocol and procedures that helped us to fine tune each step of the study for the most useful results. There can be unwanted surprises to researchers, both in protocol and procedure design, since they don't have firsthand experience living with Parkinson's. So a person with Parkinson's can help guide researchers around these potential pitfalls. Here's an area where I made an important contribution. I surveyed and interviewed numerous people with Parkinson's who exercise and I learned it would not be good to collect feedback immediately following a class since their opinions might be swayed by post-exercise fatigue. So we opted for feedback collection on the day following each class. Both during the study implementation stage and the monitoring stage, I was able to provide essential guidance on, the, on exercise comfort to the spin class participants that was not so pressing, pressing of an issue for the yoga and dance instructors who were able to take care of that issue themselves in their classes. Our findings from this pilot study will help us to do even better with protocol and procedure design in future studies. And of course, as well as with choosing uh, future topics for study. And so here we are today. I'm doing this task right now, continuing to support the valuable work of researchers through this presentation and ongoing dialogues throughout the Parkinson's community, wherever we encounter them. I hope each of you have seen how approachable the job of a research advocate is. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. I've got some tips for you if you know how to ask for them. Uh, I'm gonna make you come and, and uh, speak up. These tasks are really quite easy. It's loads of fun. It staves off boredom in the retirement years. And here's the best part. I asked some of the researchers what my biggest impact was on them. And the first response that I received was from Dr. Mary Feldman. She wrote back, inspiration. It was the first word that came to mind when you asked it immediately popped into mind. You give me inspiration and zest and make me excited to continue to do more studies to help the Parkinson's community. That said, I'd like to invite each of you uh, to join a Pedaling with Parkinson's online class that was developed uh, directly from the things that Jay Alberts and others have learned uh, through these studies. Uh, there's a website listed at the bottom of this slide, uh, www.pedalingforparkinson's.org. If you go to that website, you will find some classes listed there now that are offered Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Beginning September 15th, I'm going to offer uh, classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, 
if you have a stationary bike at home or you have a trainer that you can mount your bicycle on, um, you can log on to a Zoom session with us and join the class. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for sharing your experience as an advocate with us. I really appreciate it. I'd like to now open up uh, to some questions from our attendees. So if you orient down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see an icon that says Q and A. If you have questions for myself, for Patricia and or for John, please submit your questions there and we'll start addressing them. So the first question that's come in is directed towards you, Patricia. Mm -hmm. Someone asks, what skill sets do you bring to the table to be a good research advocate? Um, I think I'm quite a good communicator um, and so um, I can communicate to to try and encourage others to participate. I, I belong to a support group as I said during my presentation and uh, I have talked to them about being a research advocate on several occasions and uh, I hope that encouraged them, I think it did, <laughs> encourage some of them to sign up and participate. Um, I always try and re remain optimistic. The glass is always half full, that <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I'm, I'm always an optimist and, um, yeah, I think that in helps researchers to, you know, I, I try not to ask difficult questions, um, because, and, you know, or push for knowing whether it's a placebo or the real, the real thing, which I know some people are dying to know. I don't care. It is what it is. When I retired, I got a t-shirt with it is what it is embroidered on. So you, I don't worry about things you can't do anything about. So hopefully, um, you know, uh, I do what I can. And That's great. That's great. Thank you so much. I for others. Absolutely. You are very, very inspiring, very motivating <laughs> and a good communicator. <laughs> Thank you. John, I've got a question for you. Okay. And someone's asking, what do you think your biggest impact has been on the researchers with whom you've worked with? Well, I, I answered that question a moment ago. Inspiration. Uh, I got a, uh, I received a few other responses from researchers just early this morning who uh, chimed in. And one of them said that I brought a sense of teamwork uh, to their department and um, uh, and a sense of energy that that is often missing uh, he explained that after 30 years of doing bench work in a lab he had found that sometimes he was out of touch with why he was doing the research, who he was doing it for. But then meeting me and hearing my story uh, renewed his vision and helped him to um, really have a lot more energy for the work. That's great and very inspiring, certainly. So thank you for sharing that, especially the feedback from the researchers. It's really good to hear that these researchers, these scientists really appreciate the participation and contributions that you, you offer so significantly um, to the atmosphere of research in Parkinson's disease. So I have a question for both of you. Um, if you had to give a person one top reason why they should get involved in shaping research, what would it be? It will change your life. You will no longer be the victim. You will be the conqueror. Some strong words. I love it. Pat, do you have something yeah, to say? Yeah, I agree. I mean, nobody else can do what we do. We've got Parkinson's, you know, that's what researchers want. I don't want it. They can have it. <laughs> <laughs> they have access to all of it. Take it, use it, come up with a cure or better, even better treatments would be great. 
you know, without so many side effects. So please take my Parkinson's and do what you will with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you both for sharing that. A uh, question here that just came in. How much time do you spend helping with the research? So I think uh, this question could be for either one of you who would like to answer. How much time do you spend helping with the research? Yeah, I, I haven't done any clinical trials for a couple of years because I had DBS. And uh, you're not eligible for quite a lot of trials. I've done as many online um, surveys and uh, things that I can, but I haven't actually. But I, I've now started doing quite, I was working with the World, um, World Parkinson Congress uh, some of the time, and now I'm doing this kind of work with the Parkinson Foundation and the, the, new, the new project on uh, patient advisory board. So <laughs> the last two or three weeks, it's been quite a lot. Maybe, uh, I know. 10 hours a week, which doesn't sound quite a lot, but when you have to carve it out of other things, it is. And I would say that that time commitment fluctuates depending on the type of research and of course the time yeah. that someone has to commit um, right. to making their contributions to that research. So right. 10 yeah. hours is definitely a significant contribution. So I, just I mean, that, that's not usual, but you know, yeah. when quite a lot of things are going on in various places. John, what about you? How much time would you say that you've, you've put into helping support Parkinson's research? There are, there are times when it is almost nothing happening and other times it's like a full-time job. Uh, but I can make it as much or as little as I choose. Um, as the uh, advocacy program has grown and embraced uh, other community-based activities, uh, I do a lot more than just advocate for research. Uh, I'm continuing to work with the Department of Neurology at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center uh, to uh, inspire other research projects. I'm working with Mary Feldman and Stephen Lee and uh, with others there. Um, sometimes it's just conversations and tossing ideas around and uh, other times uh, more specific. But I also have done other things like uh, lead the local support group uh, and um, uh, I've been a motivational speaker for a couple of pharmaceutical companies uh, to uh, speak at their um, executive retreats and encourage uh, researchers to uh, work harder. Um, let me see. It sounds like your your time dedicated to Parkinson's research specifically fluctuates quite often. It uh, does, yes. Yeah. I think the more you do, the more you get asked to do because you're more <laughs> visible. Sure. Sure. I think that's a valid claim to make. <laughs> In my um, I have another question for you both. Okay. What has being a research advocate meant to you? How has it impacted your life? Um, uh, uh, in a couple of ways. I mean, it's great to have access to what could be, turn out to be groundbreaking drugs before they hit the market. And, uh, you know, see how they were, if you're on, on the uh, real thing. Um, and, and also I found it gives you an ear to the ground about things that are coming along in the pipeline, you know, even if, and then you can kind of try and put in a, a word of interest. But the other thing i found is that um, it gave me access to another set of movement disorder specialists, high level movement disorder specialists, as well as my regular uh, medical team. There was a whole other one, you know, in the, uh, 
in the study investigator. Um, so I found that very helpful to be examined and and have my Parkinson's discussed by a whole new team, gave me different angles on it and different opinions. Oh, absolutely. John, what about you? Krista, I think I would go back to the comment that I made earlier. Uh, it will change your life, and it has. Um, one of the uh, terrible things that Parkinson's does to a lot of people is uh, bring on uh, depression, apathy, and uh, I, I can choose to let those things take over my life mm -hmm. or I can fight back. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to fight back, then I need something substantial so that I don't feel, feel as though my efforts are futile. And by joining uh, the Parkinson's Foundation uh, advocacy program, my efforts are clearly not futile. And I'm able to through my own activities, uh, help to overcome uh, the apathy that Parkinson's wants to settle over my system and change my life. Uh, as Pat mentioned, I also get uh, inside information on things that are on the horizon and uh, the more that I know, uh, the more that I can be a conqueror against this disease in myself and in others. And, and you keep having hope. <laughs> the optimism and the hope is still there that maybe the next one <laughs> is <Yep>. it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you both so much for sharing those, those sentiments with us. I think it's important to hear that the hope does live in the research um, and being a part of that research keeps the optimism very, very alive right. um, in, in your journey through Parkinson's disease. I appreciate you sharing that with us. A uh, question that came in, I'm curious, do the researchers reach out to the advocates directly or does the foundation kind of facilitate the relationship between our Parkinson's Foundation research advocates and the researcher? So I'd like to hear what your experience has been. Well, I can't answer for everyone. Um, I can only answer for myself. What I did um, is I found a champion or that in my case, it, after hearing my story, it sounds like the champion found me. Um, that champion being Dr. Mary Feldman, who works at the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Um, and because of her encouragement and her introductions um, and her recommendations to others about me, uh, it was a lot easier for me to make contact with other researchers and uh, I came with a positive reputation because of my champion. So I would say that's one way of making contact uh, with researchers is um, work with your neurologist, your movements specialist find a champion and, uh, and then use that to make contacts with other people. Yeah, I found it's a bit of both. Um, I found the Fox Trial Finder and uh, www.clinicaltrials.gov was quite helpful. Um, and then talking to other people, you know, support groups. Uh, that's where I first started with observational trials. Uh, and then I went to the NIH and was assessed for their Parkinson's um, department. And then I got more observational trials with uh, people at NIH through that. And then um, I got two drug trials. I started with, can I say who I started with? University of Maryland. <laughs> Is that allowed? Yes. 
University of Maryland and I did do two drug trials with them and I was about to do a third. I could have done a third, um, but then I decided to have GBS. Mm -hmm. And uh, for now, that's where it stopped. Mm -hmm. But also, I mean, things like, you know, this and the, um, the patient advisory boards are through the contact because of the tra pair training mm -hmm. that we did. We got to know you all. Yeah. So, John, what I'm hearing from you is it, it, the connection already existed um, for you. It, it was organic and natural for you to connect a little bit deeper with your neurologist, who was also inspired by your, th your own thoughts on a research trial. And, and for Pat, it was um, you know, going online and searching clinicaltrials.gov right. and other opportunities to find research um, that you could enroll in. And kind of this like down spiral of a network of connections that you find yourself kind of involved in, this, in these yeah. efforts of research for Parkinson's disease. It's, it's, it's really beautiful how things seem to just organically happen when you kind of put the ask out there. And you meet people who've done the pair training at other functions, conferences, sure. and then you say, have you heard about the so-and-so trial? Oh, where right. is it? Yeah. Right. And then word of mouth. Mm -hmm. I, I went to a town hall event uh, with Senator Jean Shaheen from New Hampshire one day and stood up and uh, uh, asked if I could speak for a moment about the needs uh, of people with Parkinson's uh, in terms of health insurance and, and uh, some related topics. And she was very encouraging. She, she said, stand there and advocate as long as you choose. <laughs> well, we will listen. And uh, she had somebody at her office contact me and invite me back to several other uh, events that she has. So it was very surprising. And through my connection with uh, Senator Shaheen, uh, I was introduced to uh, the, the rest of the congressional and senators in New Hampshire. That's wonderful, uh, John. Wow. Wow. So I just want to, you know, right here and right now, give you guys a huge applause for the significant contributions you both have made in the research atmosphere of Parkinson's disease. And sincerely on behalf of the Parkinson's Foundation, we're so grateful um, for all that you do for the Parkinson's community across the United States and across the world and driving research to, towards a cure ultimately, right? That's what we're all here for. So I just wanna thank you both so much. Thank you. We're grateful for what you do. <laughs> Thank you. Keep it coming. <laughs> that is right. Without you, we couldn't make this right. work. Right. I think that, that's mutual. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like Thank to you. just invite you all to join us next Wednesday for our next event, where we will be talking about how to participate in research studies and featuring a guest speaker, Dr. Ruth Schneider of the University of Rochester, a Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence. For a complete lineup of our PD Health at Home virtual programs and for a recording of today's session, you can visit our website at parkinson.org backslash PD Health. Again, a big, big thank you to Pat and John for your time and knowledge today and to all of our attendees who are joining us. We cannot wait until we are able to see your faces in person again. So until then, we will be here for you and so will our programs. For up-to-date Parkinson's information and support, please visit our website at parkinson.org or call our toll-free bilingual helpline at 1-800-4-PD-INFO. Thank you again for joining us. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>